Excellent. I spoke to the crusade in 2009. Actually, had about a couple hundred people. Uh, Terry McCullough and I and George Allen. Um, Mr. Allen and I had written our first article on uh, the war that was making it uh, much more expensive to fix up the schools of Richmond and around the country. I see where uh, Congressman McEachin has put in a bill. Uh, he signed out to a bill with a good friend of mine also, a Congressman Dwight Evans from Philadelphia. We'll talk about that shortly. I think the best way to explain the issue is the way that I'm explaining it in an article that will be coming out in a couple of days. Because you have to put the issue of, of the old schools in Richmond and education in a certain kind of historical context, I think, to understand where we are, how we got to where we are, and what we need to do about it. Now, the Brown v. Board of Education Edition came out in 1954. We're all familiar with that. Declaring the separate but equal policies here in Virginia and across the South and some other states unconstitutional. Finding that every child had a constitutional right to equal educational opportunities in the federal constitution. However, education in this country and in this state has been primarily the responsibility of local governments. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were the appointed school board by the council in Richmond. The federal government doesn't provide a lot of money for educational funding. In fact, 7% of all the funding comes from the federal government. Here in Virginia, there is a substantial portion from the state government. We'll get to that in a second. And so in 1954, the Brown v. Board of Education said, look, folks, everyone's entitled to equal educational opportunity. That has to be defined, but that's the goal. And of course, the facilities play a role in whether you can get equal educational opportunities. You need facilities that can provide educational opportunities. Now, in 1965, well, it's actually 1960, President Kennedy, it was actually Candidate Kennedy, said that he thought the federal government had a rightful and important role in helping localities make sure they maintain modern K through 12 facilities. Again, always keep in mind that particularly politically, Candidates are very leery about, particularly federal candidates, leery about making it look like the federal government is going to impose anything on local education. That's a sure way to get defeated. So he was very careful. But he thought, and he said, modern schools are important to the future of this country. Fundamental. And so they tiptoed and small federal incentives. 1965 is the year that the Democratic Party broke with its old Southern tradition. Sort of a, there's been some I think, a recent movie on it. Uh, it was actually 1964. And the Democratic Party platform said the best investment we could make was in education and to make sure everybody graduated with a at least a skill to get a good job. And they were talking about high school at the time. In 1995, let's jump up 30 years, President Clinton was encouraged by some of us. He did the first ever inventory of K-12 facilities across the country. <laughs> Roughly about 
about a hundred thousand K through twelve facilities buildings across town. And he was shocked to discover that the average K through twelve facility was obsolete. Nineteen ninety five. And we're not just talking about rich or urban areas. It's the same in the rural towns, suburban enclaves, and urban neighborhoods across the country. 1995. Well, because he faced the Republican Congress. And of course, they were trying to, well, they were soon be trying to, they did impeach him, they were soon trying to throw him out of office. But he managed to get through a small plan which said that. We put, I don't know, 10, 20 billion. It sounds like a lot of money, but of course it isn't given the scope of the problem. They, they had these special bonds that a locality could get. You had to apply for them, hard to get them. But if you could, the federal government would pay the interest on the bonds. The locality would still have to pay the principal, but the federal government would pay, through tax credits, obviously, uh, actually, the interest. Good deal if you could get them. But you couldn't really get them. And it was a program over a couple of years. So it was a good idea. When Al Gore ran for president, one of the things he did say was he was going to make school facilities a major, uh, a major issue for him. Of course, he lost. In 2008, candidate Barack Obama was the first person to run for president to say that the state of the K through 12 facilities in this country was, it was a, it just, he eventually called them, see if I get, remember exactly what he said, they were crumbling, shameful, no, crumbling quarters of shame, was his words, which he spoke to the NAACP in June of 2009. As a candidate, he actually stood in an old school in South Carolina about 80 years, 100 years old, promised to fix that up in other schools. So he was the first one. As president, he proposed to then, remember the Democrats ran the Congress then. He proposed a bill to provide, he was going to borrow money, the federal government was going to borrow money and give it to localities. A couple of hundred billion. Now, this is the part you don't hear that much. But some of us were saying, no, they ain't going to do it. <laughs> you just don't get it. They're not going to do it. The Goldman plan, as Tim Kaine has called it, it's actually his plan, but he's nice enough sometimes to, I don't know why it puts me in it. I said, well, there's maybe a better way to do it. Well, how's that? We're all here familiar with the Maggie Walker School problem. High-tech home, basically built in the late 1990s. But most people don't understand the financing of how that was done. Because it's unique financing. I'm trying to keep this in chronology, but all right. What was proposed in the article I wrote with George Allen from the New York Times, I'm trying to get the president and his people to, to see it, is that the Democrats were not going to give you the money. And they didn't. No one wants to talk about this. I see where the president of the city council of Philadelphia, because of what's going on there, finally admitted in the newspaper, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should have actually done a little differently in 2009. They have made a mistake. We should have provided for these capital needs in the schools. They got $5 billion. The average school in, that, in Philadelphia is older than the schools of Richmond. Those schools are sufficiently old that they're not only obsolete now, when the parents and grandparents of the kids in Philadelphia went to the same schools, they were obsolete then. Mm. They're old. I mean, there's some schools they won't even send anybody to. I mean, it's, it's really bad. Okay? Well, 
What is there about the Kane School, the Maggie Walker School? All right. Best example, I'll compare. The Trump Hotel. We've all heard about the Trump Hotel in D.C. Five stars. I don't know who rates these hotels, but whatever they call them. All right. Not the point. The Trump Hotel is what? It is a modernization of the still government-owned post office, built in 1899 with federal money. The government owns the Trump Hotel. They own that building. Trump won a bid, and he said, I will put $200 billion or, to fix it up, private money, and I get a 60-year lease on the building. I pay the government a lease, and then in 60 years, the government gets it back, or before, he can sell it back. Why did everybody, why do all the big developers in the country want to do the Trump Hotel? For the same reason that Tim Kaine was able to finance the Maggie Walker School. In 1986, the Federal Rehabilitation Tax Credit was passed to encourage private capital to fix up old buildings. Richmond has actually had more of these projects than any other city in the country. Virginia's tops in the country. And what it says is this. If you'll take an old building and promise, and, the, and that's on the Federal Historic Register, which is easy to do, it's over 50 years old, and you promise to keep the historic nature of the building, which is basically the architecture, whatever, and maybe occasionally some stuff inside. You fix it up, spend as much as you want. We will give you up to 26% of the cost of modernization in tax credits. So on a $200 million profit like Trump, if that's what they say he spent, you have to have qualifying expenditures. He'll get $40 billion in tax credits, mm. which is why he likes the deal, why they all like the deal. It helps them out. Real estate deals are all leverage. You go to the bank, you want to borrow money, you say, hey, I have a lease from the government. I have a 60-year lease from the government. That's good. I got these tax credits worth a lot of money. You can have them. You don't have to put up much money to get the loan. That's why that's the deal Trump likes. Everybody else's money, little of his. But he's not alone. That's how they all operate. Well, now let's take the Maggie Walker School. The Maggie Walker School was an old Richmond school building built in the Great Depression. By the 1990s, 60 years old, couldn't do anything with it. But it cost too much to fix it up. So, Somebody said, wait a minute. Now remember the Trump Hotel. It was a post office. Now it's a hotel. Different use. Government building, government owned, but different use. They said, well, if we take the Maggie Walker building and we get it in the hands of the regional school board for the governor's school, we can argue that local school building is now a regional <coughs> school building. Same high school, but it's technically a different use. And the IRS bought the argument. Why? Because in federal law, which really wasn't very well known, or Tim, he understood it in the 90s, but it did lost is that if you're going to take a government building and fix it up, and you want to get private developers to do it, and they want to get a tax credit, they have to fix it up into a new use. they got to turn the school into a condo, into a bingo hall, something, office building. But if they fix it up into a new school, gosh forbid, no, we're not going to help you out. You're not going to get those tax credits. So the king said, wait a minute. If we get the tax credits in the deal, the developers will actually, so how does it work? $100 million school, 
you do it right now, what do you do? You issue a school bond for $100 million. You got to pay it off. But if you do a tax credit financing deal for the same $100 million school, because the government's going to give you, and the state, roughly $33 million cash value, you only got to put up $67 million. So the localities save all that money. That's why they could afford to do it. And it came, I think it came out 40%. It cost 40% less for Richmond to do a tax credit deal than it would have done the other way. It, the city couldn't afford to do it with the bonds, but it could afford to do it with tax credits. And so it did that. But no other school in the country, because they don't have, I think Appomattox has a regional school, it is the same way. But the average school stays a local school when you redo it. And because the use doesn't change, the tax credit law doesn't apply. So it applies to the Trump Hotel because it's a new use of a government building. But it doesn't apply for, for, the, for refurbishing a local school. Now, what's more important? Number two, the law is already there. This, with Trump or his people, do they, do they really care whether they do a hotel or a school? If they can make money on it? No, they don't care. The developers don't care. And it's not like you can stop them from making the money. It's in the law. There have been 40,000 projects around the country using this historic tax credit law. But it doesn't help schools because of what they call the prior use glitch that I wrote about, which says it, and the law, you know, it makes and what, prior use, you get it, right? It says exactly what it is. If you refurbish a government building into the, a prior use, which is the same thing as a, any prior use or current use, no tax credits. So, when Philadelphia popped up with this, they did a couple, about a month ago, their first survey and said, look, the average school 66 years old, it's going to cost $5 billion to fix them up. We don't got the money. Nobody's got the money. Then all of a sudden, the idea that I've been pushing, that Tim Kaine had been pushing, and of course, I, Dwight and I have been talking about it for a year, but a long time. Wait a minute. If we could change the law, one to one sentence change in the law. All you got to do is say the prior use rule doesn't apply for school modernization projects. That's it. Put it on a level playing field with every other project. And that's it. Richmond's cost of modernizing the schools can be cut between 30 and 40 percent. That's one reason I wrote my article the other day telling the governor, don't cap what the state, they, they want to cap how much state historic credits a project could make. And I said, well, that's really going to hurt Richmond and other places, schools, the schools project. And I know what the Republicans here would say, well, you know, it could be expensive, you know, that. And so that gets me to, to the point that really having laid out that, and, and, and the thing that's got me concerned is this. Virginia has no program to help localities fix up their schools. Some states do, Virginia doesn't. It has a literary fund, no money. The only thing you really got is this historic tax credit law. If you could use it to fix schools, and you can't use it now, so much, but you could if they changed the federal law, because you had the federal law and the state law together. So it's really not smart if you believe in fixing schools to want to cap that program now. I mean, we're Democrats, supposedly. And you believe in schools. You believe in the kids. Or do we? Seriously. I mean, I've written most of the words for a lot of people, but let's now go over the facts. Brown case, 1954. 1971, Virginia Constitution changed. The Constitution says every kid 
supposed to get a quality education. But as I wrote in the Richmond Times a couple of weeks ago, I was citing uh, Jeff Shapiro, who occasionally gets it right, got it right this time, that even though Doug Wilder and Henry Howe were fighting for a, uh, were fighting to make it a, a, a right to an equal, uh, equal education. If you have a right, you can enforce it. So they wrote the Constitution in such a way that they thought you're not allowed to enforce it. They wrote it as something we'd like to do, we're really going to try really, really, really hard, count on us. But it's been ruled, at least the writer, uh, said it was aspirational. Well, you can't sue to enforce an aspirational goal. It, you, there are states, New Jersey, Texas, a few others, and that's the problem for a lot of the lawmakers was, gee, we actually, if we actually made it a right for a kid, we might actually have to do it. Because there might be some lawyer like Goldman or something that, wow, we might sue and win. And then what do we do? That's 1971. Brown is 1954. In 2005, I produced a plan for the Mayor Wilder, which could have fixed up all the schools in 10 years. I showed how to do it. We had the money. They started to put the money aside, City of Future plan. It hasn't happened. Now, the thing to remember is we all hopefully will live 80, 90, what? Chuck Berry was 90. Hopefully we all can live to be 90. But you know, a school child's life in K through 12 is 12 years. So I propose to, and here it is 12 years later. So a whole generation of kids have gone through the same schools. Oh, there's one new one here and another new one there. That's not the point. Now what's impressed me over recently is Professor Glenn Earthman in Virginia Tech. You probably haven't heard of him, and I didn't hear him until I was actually looking at some uh, suits in other states, and I, they kept citing this Virginia guy, and I said, how come no one ever talks about him here? He apparently, and not apparently, he's one of the leading authorities on old school buildings. Has been for a long time. And a very nice guy. And uh, he's quantified the effect of sending a child to old, moldy, run-down, dysfunctional, obsolete schools for their entire K through 12 lifetime. And he says it costs you a year worth of learning. In other words, if you were to go to new schools and compare to what right here in Richmond, the same child would, would actually have an education that would be equal to an extra year. And we're talking, now that's pretty serious, just because of the building. Now, you know, the Brown case is famous in legal circles, not just because of the decision, which most people would, have, would, would say, yeah, of course. It's, you know, I know you had Plessy v. Ferguson, but the point is, by 1954, even the most conservative lawyers on the Supreme Court knew what the law was. But one of the things about that case was Professor Clark, who gave sociological data, which the courts have a really was sort of just beginning to use, to show why separate schools weren't just unconstitutional, they actually hurt children. It was bad. It wasn't just that it was bad law. It was bad education. And that impressed a lot of people. So I'm thinking Earthman, that ought to be pretty impressive to people. I mean, he's, he's just a nice guy from Virginia Tech. Professor's been studying this. 
and he's been writing about it and writing about it. I see where Clinton, I think, in 1985, I was looking at some stuff that mentioned some of his stuff. His stuff is now much more, people are much more realizing that old schools, the way they're designed, the health, old schools are bad for your health. And Richmond has some of, and, and four kids particularly, have immune difficulties. I, I, and before, in 2012, I had a pilot program in the Virginia public schools, which was fine until May Jones took it over. We know what happens to those things. But anyway, we discovered that many of the kids who are on Medi Medicaid right now, they're not even, they're not, they're not getting the health care they're supposed to get. I brought some interns, and my theory was, we can't, all right, parents won't take the kids to the doctor. I'll take the, I'll take the doctors to the kids. So we brought them into the schools, and they examined them right there. People walking around with heart conditions. I mean, it was people couldn't believe what they were finding out. But you, you know, this because there was an Obama study of the South. Virginia was not included. Um, but the other southern states were. 80% of the children on Medicaid were not getting the required health services. 80%. I know some, I'd written for the Post and got the governor mad, and I said, well, if you can't get the Republicans to expand Medicaid, why don't we just try to make Medicaid those who already have it? Why not try to make it work better for them? We haven't even hit the 80% target rate. There's 100,000 people who Republicans are currently willing to fund that we could sign up if we had to be more aggressive with that. But then I, I digress. So where we are now, and so one, Donald McKeachin has the bill in, HB 922. He's co-sponsor, the main sponsor is Dwight Evans. Terrific guy. Hope you get to meet him sometime. Um, and that would that would very simply say on a pro, on an historic school modernization project, the prior use rule doesn't apply. I estimate that'll open up fifteen to twenty thousand projects around the country. I try not to tell the Republicans how much money that's going to cost them to. It would be the biggest, potentially the biggest federal incentive for construction of educational infrastructure since Lincoln's 1862 Land Grant College Act, which only built 70 college. We're talking about 15,000 schools. So move aside, Abe, if we get it passed. It's my understanding that it actually the, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus is seeing the president tomorrow. I don't expect to see too many pictures of that particular day. You know, if I was if I was a Democratic congressman, <laughs> don't want to want my picture taken with Trump anytime soon. Um, but he's actually going to, if he leaves, if he does any reading, it remains to be seen if he does. He's actually going to, the package will include this bill. Ironically, he's asked for an infrastructure, he's claimed that he could do infrastructure with tax credits. And everybody has said he's crazy. I'm here to tell you that he's not crazy on education. Not that he intended to do education, don't get me wrong. He wants to do transportation, grid projects, and all that stuff. And I don't think that'll work. But on educational infrastructure, I just showed you. The Maggie Walker School is proof. You can look at the federal rehabilitation tax credit as an infrastructure tax credit. Because what are you doing? You're building infrastructure, buildings. It works. Now, why the city of Richmond has not got behind me, uh, the school board, city council, the governor, I confess to be completely flummoxed. I mean, 
That makes absolutely no sense. It's exactly what Lincoln and, and, and others who built the federal government have said, look, there ought to be a partnership. We're willing to do it the right way. The Democrats have always wanted to give you money. Let me give you an idea. After Obama got knocked, they wouldn't give him 20, 200. He tried to get 40 billion out of the Republican Congress. The good luck. And I won't say who I was up there with discussing with, because they, they like, they, they saw my proposal and everybody said, well, Paul, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help in all instances. It only applies to historic schools. Well, that's 40% possibly. 40% of the schools in Virginia and around the country are old enough mm -hmm. to qualify as historic. That's a lot of schools. And I said, okay, let's, if you want to do it the president's way, how much money, for instance, would Newport News get? That might get $20 million. It's got 24 schools of which my plan could probably help 18 of them. Now, if you're there about politics, if you got $20 million, which back then might have built one new elementary school, try giving $20 million to just one school and stiff every other neighborhood. Not going to happen. So what you'd wind up with is 20 old crumbling schools and new Purdue's all with a new roof or new windows. It wouldn't affect the education at all. Under my plan, you can build as many as you want. You gotta raise the money, but you gotta raise it anyway. Okay, you may not get one free school, but you might get a hundred billion dollars or two hundred billion dollars of savings. Here in Richmond, you could save two hundred million dollars is our estimation. Roughly. It depends on what schools you want and how you do it and how expensive. But we have a lot of schools that qualify as historic schools in Richmond. Almost, we have, in fact, we have an historic school district which was set up. And I think that almost half of our schools are already on the National Registry because uh, historic architects, I think the first African American architect, uh, designed a lot of them. And Richmond's schools are really, I mean, the architecture is. Fabulous. The reason why the other half probably aren't on the registered list is why spend the time and money to put them on the list? I mean, unless you just want to have a plaque, it doesn't do anything. Now, if a developer had to do it, the developer pays for it because they want to get the tax credits. The point is, Richmond could save a lot of money. The state of Virginia could save billions of dollars. School projects which are unaffordable around the country become affordable. The great irony is Trump's the only president who actually would understand it because he's a builder, which is kind of, I mean, it's just things that are crazy enough, and that's just another crazy angle to the whole thing. That he actually, if you could present it to him, would say, yeah, Ivanka can probably do them all, right? And so we'll do all the schools. I don't have any problems with that. I return, though, to Professor Earthman. Now, if you take Professor Earthman to heart, why is there not more of a human cry in the city of Richmond from the average citizens, particularly African American community? And let's understand, let's get you know, facts are facts. The city is what? Roughly half white, half African American. But 90% of the school system is non white kids, of which most of those come from families of sufficiently modest means that they qualify for a, not just a free lunch, but a free breakfast. Now, if Earthman is right, then we have for the last 12 years just let a whole other generation of kids go through the schools, schools which are going to hurt them, they're going to lose a year's worth of education, and now we wonder. It's interesting, and, 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 and it seems as if we talk a good game, but we don't do anything.
Folks won't even lobby for a bill that saves them huge money. I know this for a fact because I went up there and done it all. I just do it for, like anything. It's like the army, right? You volunteer for something, it's yours. That's why you don't volunteer for nothing. Okay. So I wrote the thing. Jim Webb put it in. Mark Warner signed on. Even I didn't know Eric Cantor. You don't want us to get Eric Cantor to do anything. Nobody wanted to pay attention to it. Nobody wants to do anything. I'll close by saying this. Uh, we have to answer questions. Let's put the tax credit aside. The city of Richmond has enough money right now to fix up the school. So let them keep it in. If I did it, they could do it. It costs twice as much because they delayed but the city budget. Twice as big. I just, I think these kids deserve a little bit more than what we give them. The status quo is unacceptable. I don't, I don't think it's a hard sell because Donald Trump, if he was presented with it, you know, obviously he's a hard guy to deal with and who wants to deal with him? I get that. But he is the president for now and it's hard to get, you know, the law says he won't sign it. He's already done this project. Somebody bragged about his hotel. All you're saying is, you promised to help fix infrastructure. You promised all these things. You promised the states right there. Let, let, yeah, I think he'd sign in a heartbeat. I actually think he'd, he'd be willing, he'd be open for changes to make it more valuable to Richmond. Because the better it is for Richmond, the better it is for the developers. One quick follow-up, Matt. The historic tax credits in Virginia have turned them under a lot of scrutiny for shady deals. Uh, what is the climate for the health of historic credits in Richmond or Virginia going forward? Oh, there's a couple of shady operators, but the fact of the matter is it's actually one of the most police programs. And the reason they got caught is because the IRS is, checks all these problems. You, you know, before you get the credits, it's checked, and that's why they, but those, you're talking about complete scam operations. You know, that they basically weren't even doing it. Uh, uh, you gotta put up the money, you gotta keep the historic quality, it has, the building actually has to be in service before you get the credits. So you put up a lot of money, and you're waiting a couple of years to get your credits. And so, the lawyers, everybody's on the hook. So these projects, that's why it's 40,000 around the country and why it has very strong support around the country. There are some Republicans that don't like it, yes, but they're a minority. Do you have questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I You can do it two ways. But the way Kane did it is they sold the building and then the city leased it back. And it had a, uh, in the lease, has a purchase agreement. So you, you basically you sign a lease with a the developer. They take the lease and everything to the bank. Because remember, they want to do some borrowed money, not their own. So the lease will have how much you're going to pay for 20 years, 30 years, escalated clauses. We'll also have, if you want to buy the building back from us, this is the price. And that, that, that they do it that way. There's a lot of legal reasons for that. Usually, the developers and the investors want to sell the building back after seven years because after seven years, they've used up all the credits and they want to take their money and do another deal. 
So that's how Cain did it. And so the building, that uh, Magnum Office School is now back in the control of the, of the school board. Now, you could also do it the way Trump did it, which is you get, you keep the building, the developer fixes it up, and then you pay them a lease because now you're using it. So it's, it stays a school building, but you pay them a lease because they got to get paid back for all the money they put in there. And again, you'll have something in there which says, look, we just want to buy the building back for cash, and, it's, and they would gladly do that. So you have a choice of either the Kane way or basically keep the building. In the end, you got to really, when you get to ownership and this and that, it really doesn't matter who has the title. Now, it could be in the city of Richmond that maybe the city might own it, but the government would always control the building that goes on inside of it, um, if they want. The local government. The local, the, the local government of the school, it's whatever. Remember, you're not obligated to do this. You could use bond financing. You could do anything you want. This is just an option that would save you money. Uh, I've heard, I've talked to people, and they said, well, you know, um, the residents of our area want a new school. They're not going to like a refurbished school. They want a new one. I said, even if it costs 40% more? Well, I don't know about that. So it's just, it's your choice. Right now, you don't have it. So let's take one. One last question. We have one more speaker. Uh, one last question, and hopefully, uh, summarizing, uh, Paul can tell us what it is, Mr. Goldman, what it is that the Crusade or what are you proposing um, for action. for action to get this done? If we're going to renovate the schools in Richmond, I, I I'd like to wait until everybody's asked that question because I'd like to put that very motion on the floor. Well, have you already put that motion on the floor? I'm not aware of it. Oh. I'm not sure this is. the same thing. It's the same thing. We're answering I'm not sure you're thinking about the same motion I want to put on the floor. I remember we did that. This is a different motion. Oh, sorry. Let's take a look. So, uh, any more questions before we finalize here? Uh, Mr. Jewell? Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everybody.